Hello everyone, you've joined the live SIPS Best in Big Human webinar. We'll get underway shortly. We'll just allow for a few more seconds for people to join before we get started. This is gonna be an exciting session today. Really looking forward to hearing uh, water care stories. So there's still a few more attendees joining. We'll be getting underway shortly. Hope everyone's week is going to ride. I'll encourage you while you're waiting just to um, start making some comments in the chat box. Tell us where you're from, how your day is going, what are some of the challenges that you're experiencing you in your role at the moment and what you're hoping to get out of this session, whether there's any particular element you'd like to explore. Okay, I think we might be ready to make a start. Um, Kia ora and welcome everyone. My name is Giovanni Ferrante. I'm the marketing manager for SIPS in the Australian New Zealand region. Uh, pleasure to be your host for today. Um, we've been doing a few of those webinars, um, not just recently, but in the past few years as well. Um, as mentioned at the start, this webinar is part of a series called Best in Procurement. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to showcase and broaden the good news stories coming out of procurement teams from around the region. Featuring the winners of our Supply Management Awards gives a platform for procurement to elevate its profile and its stance within the business community. We've had such great examples of procurement and supply chain function delivering amazing outcomes for, for their businesses. Before we get started, um, I would like to um, acknowledge traditional owners of the land and um, salute uh, respectfully uh, traditional communities. So first and foremost, Tinakoto, 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 Katoa. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Aboriginal Indigenous people on which I'm uh, sitting on today. And that's the Wurundjeri Wurrung and Wurrung peoples from the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people um, listening in today, as well as our Maori and Pacifica community that might be present on the call. So welcome again. Um, today's focus will be on the winner of the procurement transformation category, one of the high, most highly contested category uh, in our awards, which is more of a credit to Watercare, who's a winning organization. So this category recognizes uh, large scale procurement transformation project. Um, and it's aimed at looking at large business process improvement projects that have resulted in improved business outcomes or competitive advantage. So a project can be procurement-led or wider organizational project, but they must explicitly explain the role of procurement and the influence on delivering those outcomes. As per usual, um, Zoom housekeeping rules, we are recording this session and we will make that available at a later stage for you to um, go back and look at some of the insights that the water care team will be sharing with us today. I encourage you again to interact both with other attendees and our panelists and speakers, as well as the SIPS team, my colleague Sophia is on the line as well. Um, please uh, make comments um, in the chat box, again, interact with each other. I'll also encourage you to take a very short survey at the end of the session. It gives us an opportunity to um, improve upon what we do, but also gives uh, our presenters some helpful feedback. And last but not least, I'll strongly encourage you to ask questions as many as you possibly can to pick the brains of our presenters. They might give you insights and inspiration for things that you can apply in your own organization. So 
Enough talking. A little bit more about the project before I hand over to Stuart Bird and Anna Mobridge, uh, who have kindly um, made themselves available to, to present today from the work care team. So um, the project that was successful is the enterprise model. So in a nutshell, what happened is Auckland's uh, water and wastewater service provider, Watercare, runs operations intrinsically linked to the environment. So when a company mobilised to deliver uh, an improved low carbon infrastructure, it really needed a, a, a procurement rethink. So the enterprise model uh, is water care new collaborative procurement strategy, enabling it to deliver its full 40-2020 vision. And I'm sure uh, Stuart and Anna will elaborate on that. So the vision of reducing carbon in construction 40%, reducing the cost to deliver by 20% and improving health, safety, and well-being by 20%. So traditionally, what a case approach to infrastructure was to engage contractors by project uh, on construction only and occasionally design and build arrangements. So this would no longer be sufficient. So a 2.4 billion infrastructure program would be achieved through a collaborative 10-year partnership with two construction constructors. As such, Watercare, uh, New Zealand's second largest company by asset size, needed to ensure the procurement process was not only innovative, but also agile. So the both strategy relied on a three-stage evaluation process, including interactive workshops. This process took only seven months from initiating the team to signing the contract on in 2019. So under conventional method, this would have taken 12 to 18 months, but what a case empowered the human team and ensured that the process was achieved with speed, quality, and confident management. So that's a preamble to um, what we're in for today. And to share insights on this project, we have Anna Morgridge, continuous improvement and agile lead. A little bit about Anna, she's passionate and driving collaborative working to overcome challenges. And what a care, she's the continuous improvement lead, working with teams to apply agile approaches enable continuous improvement, drive innovation, and develop high-performing teams. Originally from a scientific background, she has seven years experience in the water industry in both New Zealand and the UK. She's worked in asset management, procurement, digital transformation, and more recently on the water care enterprise model, the newly integrated model for infrastructure and construction delivery. And we have also Stuart Bird, who's the head of supply chain and water care. He is a very passionate procurement leader with a drive for knowledge sharing. He was an early adopter of agile methodologies uh, for procurement and has a wealth of experience with over 20 years in procurement across UK, Asia and New Zealand. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to thank once again uh, Stuart and Anna for joining us today. Delighted to have you on board, and we are um, very thankful you agreed to share uh, your insights with us and with our community. So, welcome once again, Stuart and Anna, and over to you. Looking forward to hearing your insights and your side of the story. Great. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for the introduction, Giovanni, um, and, uh, and thank you for those uh, words in Māori as well. It's uh, very impressive. Uh, and thanks for that introduction. I, I think maybe we can move straight to question time. Um, look, we will just run through this. Um, so uh, I don't need to provide any context because I think Giovanni's done a, a great um, job of that. Uh, so let's just jump through. What we want to cover today is really our journey with the enterprise model, uh, why we um, came up with the enterprise model, what we we're trying to achieve with it, uh, how we're going to ensure ongoing value, how we procured the partners for the model and how we did that in seven months, the successes we've had so far, and we're going to touch on the award and kind of what that means for us and maybe some um, hints and tips that we've kind of learned along the way with this. Um, so just starting, the, the genesis of the enterprise model for us was actually a category strategy review. So um, the procurement team and the infrastructure team sat down um, and started a category strategy review that really um, ballooned quickly into the enterprise model, which is what we will go through with you today. 
So we started with a vision that needed to be bold, and that vision was 40 2020, which Giovanni touched on. So that's a 40% reduction in carbon, uh, build carbon that is, a 20% reduction in cost to deliver our infrastructure program, and 20% year on year improvement in health and safety and well being. Um, you know, we've acknowledged that climate change is one of the largest challenges that we face as a business. Being in the water industry, we know that we're vulnerable to increasing temperatures, changing rain patterns, we're in a drought right now, and sea level rise. Health and safety and wellness was also where it should, um, wasn't where it should be. And we needed a cost reduction to help change the game in addressing the cost and increases we've been seeing. To achieve this, we couldn't keep doing what we were doing, and we, we needed to reinvent the way that we delivered infrastructure. Uh, and we also couldn't do that on our own. So we had actually started our process um, on the enterprise model and we had done some market briefing. What was really good and supported what we're doing is the construction sector accord was uh, launched by the New Zealand government. This effectively is a shared commitment between government and industry to transform the construction sector. So this it literally came out between two of our market briefings and we literally changed a couple of words and this was really applicable to what we were wanting to achieve and helped us communicate with the marketplace what we we're wanting to do. So the challenge and what we were trying to address was there was a lot of inefficiencies in traditional project-based procurement models. This has led to serious issues in the industry in terms of profitability, risk allocation, training and investment uh, and low productivity. This was exemplified by a number of high profile contractors collapsing. Um, the other thing was the sector contributes a lot to carbon emissions. The focus traditionally had been on operating carbon and that was the same for us. And when we did the evaluation, we discovered that our build carbon was actually twice that of our operating carbon. So we knew we needed to do something to help in that space. Uh, as I mentioned, the sector had issues with health and safety and wellness. Uh, it actually has the highest suicide rate um, of any sector in New Zealand. And we felt that we needed to try and develop a model that was to allow improvements in that terrible statistic. So we had a lot of problems that we're trying to address, but we also had some strategic advantages. So we had a fully funded 10-year, um, $5 billion asset program. We're largely free from uh, political interference. So we had a lot more surety over our program than perhaps other asset owners in New Zealand. So this meant that we wanted to develop a model that would leverage the true value of this program of work rather than each individual project. So uh, Anna is, uh, actually has drawn this model, which is a fantastic um, drawing of it. So it actually, um, you know, describes the model really well. And effectively what we've done is we've got ECI on all projects. So we're bringing the construction partners right to the front end of project delivery. They're now involved in uh, business cases, optioneering, program optimization, and design on every basis. So after we looked internationally at best practice, um, collaborative models, we saw a lot of feedback from the marketplace. Um, and really what we, did when we designed this was to try and deal with those industry issues that were suffering, uh, you know, that was affecting our construction partners. And in return, we wanted to incentivize them to deliver on the 40 20 20 outcomes. So, you know, what we wanted is a model that enhances resilience of these construction partners, and we we're going to do that through long term security to allow them to have investment in people, equipment, have better risk allocation through uh, collaborative risk and. Um, yeah, and have that whole program approach. So we actually, we had this philosophy early on, which was program before project. And then we just, the, the collaborative part, um, the collaborative team that involves our designers and our constructors and water care staff is simply just called program first. So it really does what it says on the tin. So then we need to develop a commercial model um, around the enterprise model and go out to market to select two um, construction partners to uh, integrate into the model. So as I mentioned before, we wanted to have a long-term 10-year uh, 
program to give them a surety of work. Um, we talked about risk allocation. We also wanted to get our suppliers involved in the um, early parts of uh, project delivery. Incentivization to deliver at the program level was going to be key, uh, and clearly the 40 20 20 outcome was there. So, with the 10 year program with no tendering, so one of those other aspects of it is that the work is allocated to each construction partner. So, there's no tendering cost, there's no kind of ugly risk transfer through a tender. Um, they know who's doing the project right up front from ECI and they can bring their value um, earlier on in that process. But we were challenged with how we're going to ensure ongoing value. So one of the key things with that was that we needed to be really clear around what we wanted to achieve in the long run, and that wasn't just 40-20-20. We embedded our SRM framework into the model, and it's actually part of the contract agreement. And this will help us stay true to the outcomes. So incentivization um, is one of those really key commercial aspects that we wanted to help drive and manage that ongoing value. So the first two incentives are actually contractual incentives. The first one is straightforward in the sense that it's profit at risk, um, and that's based on performance on KRAs. But the interesting thing with that one is both construction partners are subject to the same performance KPI. So that encourages them to collaborate. We used the example early on where if somebody needed a crane, they would, the other partner would be commercially incentivized to provide them with a crane because that would actually have a financial impact for them in terms of this incentive. And just last week that um, actually came true where we had one of the construction partners loan the other one a crane um, you know, for a better program outcome. So the next one is incentive two, and this is the long-term incentive, which is on a biannual basis, and this is centred on 40-20-20, so, and outperforming 40-20-20. So this incentive pool is generated through savings beyond 20%, and the savings beyond 20%, 80% um, of those savings are banked by the construction partners and the design pay, uh, partners, then that, that's allocated to all of the parties on a, you know, on a certain ratio. Um, so they fill it up with savings and they get that released based on outperforming 40, 20, 20. Now, the other thing is we talked about non-contractual incentives, which was three and four. So this was around construction sector scrutiny. We really wanted to, um, you know, to, to publish this model and, and, uh, and push it out there in the marketplaces, we believe that this is going to be a model for the future to deliver infrastructure. So we wanted to put pressure on ourselves and our construction partners to make this successful. Um, as I mentioned before, the construction sector accord, we're now a beacon project for the construction sector accord. So both the client being Watercare and our construction partners are really invested in making this model work. Uh, and the incentive for for our construction partners, and that was marketability for their business. Um, they were going to have a secure pipeline of work that allowed them to enhance their capability, develop their skills, and they can also then market their, um, you know, their participation in a collaborative delivery model. Over to Anna. How did we do it? And Anna's a key reason of how we did it in this time. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart. Um, so I suppose there's two aspects to the trunk the transformation, transformation that this brings. So one of them, transforming our approach to procuring our construction, which Stuart's talked through. But actually, we think the procurement journey we took it on was quite transformational as well. It's very different to how we would procure um, construction contractors normally. So the first um, thing that we're, and we're quite proud of this is the time it actually took to do the procurement. So to start with, Yes, we put together a category strategy and we did a bit of in-market engagement and internal workshops. But from the point that we said, yeah, we're going to do something about this, we're going to go to market and go for a programme view, to the contract awards for seven months. So that was pretty record time. As Giovanni said, we thought but if there was the construction project at this time we were taking to market, it would probably take 12 to 18 months, but we were able to do it in four months. 
Um, so we're very proud of that. Seven, seven months. <laughs> Four months. <laughs> Four months. I was <laughs> them. <laughs> um, so I'll just tell you a bit about um, what the process was and how we managed to, to do that in that short time frame. So the first thing was we had a dedicated procurement team working on this. So it was a small focus team who used agile methodologies to run this process. So there's probably around five people in that team and it was cross-functional from water care's procurement team and some external providers and some of the subject matter experts. And those people were working together in an agile sprint fashion. So that's using two week blocks and every two week block, you're very focused on very specific outcomes for that section. And this allows you to take things that are very big and complex and lots of unknown questions and break them down into small pieces that then you can focus on and deliver piece by piece. And we found when attacking this huge big procurement, we needed um, contractors to, to take us forward with this programme. It was really valuable to be able to do that and break it up. The other thing it allows and it encourages is the engagement with stakeholders. There was a lot of stakeholders um, involved in this process. We've got our executive team, there was the infrastructure team, our operations team, and lots of people were very bought into how we were doing this going forward. And we wanted to bring them along the journey and the transformation. We didn't want to just um, produce something at the end and then everyone be in shock because it was so dramatically different. If we took them along the way, it was going to make a lot of difference. So we did lots and lots of workshops with a core group of people. And so to start with, that was maybe two or three a week. And as we moved on, people were growing in confidence and the hard decisions were made up front. So it allowed us to really speed up after those decisions were made. And we also had, as part of the sprint cycle, a sprint review every two weeks. So we gathered together all the stakeholders and the executive in a room and review what have we achieved in the last two weeks? What are we going to aim for in the next two weeks? Get a bit of feedback and then make sure the next two weeks were even more of a success. And what was really good with those sessions is actually the people had already been involved in that decision making through the sprint. So when it got to the review, they were saying, yeah, that's what we said. We agree. We've, we've already seen that. We're already happy. So it meant it was a really smooth process and we weren't sending any, we were hardly sending any documents around at all. It was all documented after the decisions were made, which greatly improved the speed. The other thing Agile does is it increases the um, transparency transparency, and the makes everything visible so you'll see in the bottom left of this slide there's a risk board so as soon as anyone came into the room we were working on they could look straight away at the risk board and saw what our bright red top corner risks were to concentrate on so for example we'd have the chief financial officer come in and say okay what are you doing about this risk how can I help you and um, so that was really good and really supportive so with this transformation, there was a lot of change required. It was a huge change for our suppliers to start with. So um, they were going from having very transactional relationship with us to something quite different. So as Stuart said, we had numerous market briefings to bring them along the journey. But we also had to do the same with our people at Watercare. From going from a client contractor relationship, arguing over every single variation and every single contract detail, and we wanted to move to a partnering model. Actually, you're in it together. We're making collaborative decisions. That's quite a transformation. It's quite a change for people. So we really had to bring everyone that was working in that space along the journey. So one of the things we did here was running multiple showcases. So you'll see the picture in the middle there. We've got Steve Webster, our chief infrastructure officer, doing a talk. We just open invite to everyone at Watercare come along. We had 170 at the one that's shown there. And that was the chance for him to share the why. Why are we making this change? What, what's it going to mean for you? How's it going to impact you? What do we need you to do? And give them a chance to ask questions. And that was really valuable because when it came then to launching the enterprise model and through the first year, we've had lots of engagement. People understand why we're doing it. They know it's not going to be perfect to start with, but because people have felt they've been on the journey, it's really helped out. 
So now we'll talk about a little bit about the actual procurement and the evaluation process. So we did a one stage procurement process, but just with different evaluation steps. So we just went to the market the once with our RFP. Now, this was a bit of a risk because we could have potentially had 100 applicants and made our evaluators not very happy. But because we did um, so much market engagement beforehand and a few different, so we did sort of wide market briefings and then we did some more um, specialised ones to the contractors that we had in or that were sort of met the capability. Um, it meant that we actually, when we came to doing the RFP, we actually only had six applicants of really high capability, all very uh, competent and able to be part of the enterprise model. So that was fantastic. Um, so that the first stage in our evaluation, so a three stage process was a pass fail. So that was kind of our safety net in case we did get those 100 applicants. And that was just looking at capability. Could they do it? Could they deliver? the programme, the size that we were talking about and the diversity um, with water and wastewater infrastructure. The second stage then was the quantified um, evaluation. So looking at the RFP, so we'd asked about how they would deliver the programme, how they'd address 40 2020, um, what their workforce was like, what the capability was like, and then that was evaluated through that quantitative method. And then the third step, which was quite new for us on infrastructure programmes was evaluation, evaluation workshops or interactives as we call them. So this was a few separate workshops that had quite distinct um, aims to them. So we had a, an executive one where we um, got the executives from the construction companies up talking to our executives. Um, and that was really where we were testing how bold they wanted to be were they willing to take the challenge? Were they willing to take the risk with us with such a transformational different model? Did they want to be on that journey with us? Did they believe in 40, 20, 20? And then after that, we had a collaborative interactive. So this was more the individuals that would be involved in delivering the enterprise model, seeing how they behaved, how they interacted with each other, um, what things came up there. And we actually, as one of the evaluation criteria, we looked at behavior here. We brought in some external experts and did some sort of scientific behaviour assessments as well and brought that into our analysis. And then the final stage of the value, um, the interactives, was actually a sort of mock real life challenge where we set them a programme. We told them what the programme drivers were, what was happening in that space, and they had to um, adapt the initial plan for that area. So there a few different projects and how they would deliver 40 2020 through those projects. That was really exciting to see the, the teams already thinking in the way they'd be thinking once they were working with us. And then from there, we got two construction partners who went into a short period of negotiation about three weeks and then signed them up. Agile negotiation. Agile negotiation as well, <laughs> all the way through. Um, so just a bit of information there on the RFP. We were really proud of the, the RFP that we produced. So it was really high quality. I think having a focused team on it really helped to drive it through. So once we'd selected our construction partners, we had a potpourri to welcome them into our business. And the symbolism of this uh, traditional Māori um, uh, you know, cultural practice was really important for both parties. And that was around welcoming them into our organisation to establish the collaborative relationship which we desired. So afterward, um, had the POFRI and announced the partnership, um, we received a large amount of support from industry bodies, um, such as Infrastructure New Zealand, and the mainstream media was also very interested in this and um, published a few articles on that just because of the uniqueness of the model. So, you know, it was quite a good for all parties involved in this to see the mainstream media pick this up and, and kind of publish it because of the challenge which we are putting down for ourselves. What happened next after the procurements, this, that was a year ago now that we signed the contract 
And actually, the first thing we went into was a transition period. So this was a 12 weeks time box transition period. And throughout the procurement process, we were very open with saying that water care didn't have all the answers. We didn't know the exact details of how things were going to work. We actually wanted to get our partners on board first, and then we'd work out with them how things are going to play out and how we're going to do things. So, for example, the charter was something we collaboratively developed in the transition, and also the KPIs, for example, we developed there. So the transition team was made up of so water care, and we had the construction partners there. And we also had representatives from our professional engineering services panel that uh, offer the design capability. So that was a panel we already had in place prior to the enterprise model, but we've bought into the way of working. So once that transition um, was completed, that's when we sort of signed the final contract. So success so far. So how has the journey been over the last year? Well, you'll all know that the last year has probably not been what we all expected. There's been a few um, hiccups along the way, shall we say. And uh, Stuart alluded to in the beginning that one of the things about the enterprise model is that we wanted to give certainty to our contractors. And we had this 10 year programme all lined out, which would have been fantastic if um, we didn't have a few of these hiccups. But actually having the enterprise model in place and having those partners has put us in a really strong position. Um, so if we talk about COVID, there's actually through all that time we were able to support each other. And since then, there's been what's called the Shovel Ready Programme. So this is something the New Zealand government's funding to get infrastructure moving. So there's a few of our projects and programmes of works that are relating to that. So we've had to get quick startups um, with those projects. So having our enterprise model partners to call on for that's been really valuable. And the other thing that on top of COVID that happened was um, Auckland has experienced the worst drought I think ever for Auckland. Um, and potentially this year could be the driest year we've had. So that's put a bit of stress on water care being the water provider in Auckland. So we've had to completely shift our priorities so a lot of things that we would have planned to do, we've said, right, we now need to focus on um, some drought resilience projects and new water projects and getting them up running really quickly. So again, we've been able to use our enterprise model partners. We've been able to work with them right from saying, yeah, we need to do this, getting them um, early contract involvement, integrated with our design teams, integrated with our teams to deliver solutions really quickly. So that's been really valuable. Um, I suppose with those ones, we would have liked to have spent a bit more time um, optimising the programme and getting 40, 20, 20 benefits, but we sort of had to do it the other way around. But at least it gives us a test bed where we've been able to try out lots of new ways of working and lots of new things. So that's been fantastic. And we are still very early on in our programme. So it's 10 years and we're one year in. So we've got plenty of time to um, see more of those benefits come through. Okay, finally, I'll talk about the award. So um, back in August, was it? Um, we won the award for procurement transformation in the SIPS Supply Management Awards. And this was fantastic. We were so excited. Um, fortunately, the sort of COVID levels at the time in Auckland meant that we could get together, bring the team back together and have a little party and watch it all together on a big screen. So it was um, fantastic when we won and we had to watch the little video of ourselves um, uh, <laughs> accepting the award and um, so yeah thank you very much to SIPS for hosting those awards and it really does mean a lot to us because as Stuart said one of the things we want from the enterprise model is to be a beacon we want it to um, show that this partnership approach to infrastructure delivery is a way forward and the enterprise model is a way forward and 40 20 20 something that we want people to pick up and go with so having awards and being recognised for this internationally is amazing because it really um, boosts, boosts that image. Um, we were asked to share a few tips about um, entering the awards. And one of those is, we'll just say, just make sure as you're going through these processes that you just record as much as possible. Take loads and loads and loads of photos. Um, 
I mean, there were a few photos in this presentation, but I kicked myself that I didn't take more. Um, Stuart was saying he was looking for the team photo and the best team photo we could find was one with us there with loads of Lego, which probably out of context would look a bit strange. <laughs> He's a bit suspicious of using Lego, so I would have taken slightly on. So, um, yeah, just make sure you're documenting things as you go along and recording things would be good because um, that gives you a lot of good collateral when it comes to awards. Um, yeah, yeah. Just in time. Stop yeah, I'll stop oh, sharing and I'll hand back again. Yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Um, what, uh, what a fantastic project. Uh, I've got a lot of questions myself, but um, the audience has been very engaged and very active. So um, let, let's start with some of the things that, um, that have come up. So the first question um, is, is anonymous. Uh, it's asking, how did you capture inefficiency and how and where do you track them? The challenge in procurement is to justify the savings by addressing the inefficiencies. So, do you have a mechanism to address that? Oh, oh that's a fantastic question. <laughs> <laughs> um, and look, I suppose because it's such a far-reaching model, there's a number of areas which we did that. Um, the, the first one that jumped to mind was if we look at the inefficiency of tendering. Um, we kind of played a game of percentages. And if we look at the offsite overhead component from our contractors, you know, that can be quite loaded in all of their tendering costs. And we know that that can be very, very expensive for our construction partners. So, uh, and often, you know, heavy financial security packages and things like that. So what we wanted to do is strip that out of that overhead and try and get better at it. So what we did is we said, we're gonna pay you to build up your pricing, which, seemed crazy and it was a hard sell but what it meant is we had a benchmark for their pricing and uh you know and the objective is to get better and better at their pricing both on our side and their side um and what it meant is that their, um, the inefficiencies if you like that were ha uh, uh, that were kind of hidden within the off-site overhead was all exposed so we knew what we had to work on um, and we also did that in terms of, you know, as I mentioned, re reducing financial securities and things like that to take that to the program level, which means that they could skinny that margin. So that was a real sort of, you know, quantitative way which we could demonstrate that um, and we could look at the model. Um, I wonder if there are any specific inefficiencies. Other than That's that. probably the main one. Um, but the, throughout having the early contractor involvement, um, should get rid of quite a lot of inefficiencies from having handovers. Um, so often if you're designing a project and then hand it to a contractor, there might be quite a lot of elements of redesign. So, I mean, we've not got quite so far into sort of baselining what that's, that's looked like, but that's the kind of thing that we're going to be measuring going forward. Yeah, we, we don't want to see variations in construction because the constructor has been involved through the design and the constructor actually has a contract through that design. It also reduces the, the project delivery time because when they're involved in the design process, they're actually building up their pricing rather than design being finished, chucked over, you produce a tender, you throw it out to market. By the time design's finished, we should really be weeks away from entering into a construction contract because they've been building that up. So that inefficient process gets kind of skinnied down but yeah, I mean, this, yeah, I don't know. This, <laughs> we keep going on that, but that makes a lot of sense. Thank, thank you for for sharing those those thoughts. Um, another question from Cosma: How did you get to that particular percentage of savings in your model? I guess that's referring to the forty twenty twenty. How did you? Well, how, did, how did we come? Up? How did we come up with that? I think my connection is breaking up a little bit. How did you establish the percentage um, of savings yeah. in your model at 40, 20, I guess? So that's probably a, a presentation in itself that our chief infrastructure officer um, does very well. Um, really? It, it wasn't rocket science. Although in saying that, what we, um, there was actually a McKinsey um, and it, study that was done around inefficiency uh, and lack of productivity in the construction sector globally. 
And that kind of centered some of our early thinking around productivity. So we used the basis of kind of some of those theoretical productivity studies to, to think around what we could achieve. Um, we looked at really quite mature models in the space, such as Anglian Water. We're often um, you know, on a phone call to them late at night. But really, at the end of the day, we, we had those numbers and we had that feeling. But the chief infrastructure officer kind of just went, 40, 20, 20. And we all went, all right, that'll work. And then we just continued beavering away and kind of integrating that into our incentive models and, and what we were doing. The link between the carbon and the cost one, so the two to one ratio is something that's um, quite widely known and widely recognised. So that there was a bit of science. Yeah, yeah so, I, so that's where um, for every two units of carbon you take out, you take one dollar out. And we've seen evidence of that internationally. So there was a, a link between those two that was quite solid. And, and for me personally, um, having worked with engineers quite a long time, apologies to any engineers on the, the line, it's not a criticism, but um, the, 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 when taking carbon out of building infrastructure turned cost into an engineering challenge, but if you give an engineer a cost challenge, meh, it doesn't seem to sort of work. But when you say take carbon out, they're like, oh, this is an engineering problem, and hey, presto, all of a sudden they're taking cost out almost inadvertently, and I, and I think that that's been a real game changer that I've observed in that kind of engineer's way of thinking. These are good questions. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> very interesting. I think, you know, leveraging the, the stakeholders in the business to help you generate, you know, and achieve your goal is important. Um, Jay's um, commenting on a great presentation. So, um, oh, well, well done. And he's asking if you had your time again, what would you have done differently? What are some of the key learnings you would have taken back to the start if you had a chance? Mm. Good question. Lots of learnings. I think that um, the change management piece is something not to be underestimated. I mean, mm. we did put a lot of effort into it and we did put a lot of resource and stuff behind it, but it's something that's, um, and yeah, Jay will know this, but. Um, is something that you really, I mean, you can't do it overly well, I'd say. So, because um, we're still we're still on that journey. So that's one place I'd say really focus on. And I think the other thing is we probably could have spent more time getting alignment from some of our external service providers. Um, needless to say, lawyers probably don't like Agile that much. Um, we were lucky in some of our external providers like Probity they kind of got it, um, but we didn't do enough kind of management with them, but they were coming along for this journey at a really quite an extreme pace. Um, and, and they actually told us afterwards that they would go back into their business and get feedback. And they say, no, there's no way they're going to do it in that time. But they didn't tell us that. They kept on turning up to the stand-ups and making sure that we were following good probity. But we, we could have brought them along earlier into the journey. So they, they got that way of working. And maybe I wouldn't have committed to such tight time frames to the board because I can only really blame myself for that. But hey, it was a good challenge. <laughs> then aim, aim higher. And I guess that touches on the, the, the other question that came through on uh, sort of the challenges specifically to, you know, the agile speed. Uh, but you, you did mention um, a couple of things on, on that area. Um, another question from, from Kajma. Um, you mentioned selecting the preferred supply first and then finalizing the KPIs with them. Um, did that lead to any disputes as the KPIs were not made clear during the tender process? Um, not really. So we did, we did several steps of the KPIs. So actually, one of the interactive challenges we asked them to do was to come up with some KPIs. So it was quite interesting because so even before we'd selected them, we'd seen what their thought processes were with coming up with the KPIs and then we developed them further in transition. But actually what we did with those KPIs for incentive one is we gave the first year as a year grace period. So we were going to pay out the incentive no matter what the KPI showed just to make sure we've got the right KPIs. So they are we're just sort of solidifying them at the moment because it is. There's so many things we're looking for in the outcomes. There is a big range of KPIs. And we also, 
it's not like an alliance where you kind of say, right, we're all going to do things the same way. We're all going to measure them the same way. We wanted to tie in the measures with things that the organizations were already looking at. So people and capability, for example, we didn't want to put in a KPI that then meant that every organization had to change the way they were delivering their um, people capability service. We wanted to make sure we took the best from those organizations, brought them together and then made the enterprise model, model even better. So it has been a long journey, but um, there's not really been any disputes at all. It's just been about making sure we're measuring the right things that are going to drive the right behavior. So people are passionate about that. Awesome. Um, Darren is also complimenting on a, on a great presentation and uh, well deserved uh, winning entry at the award. Um, what was the overall approach plan for the outset or did it grow organically? Uh, I, I suppose yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think if you describe the outset um, as the first, uh, you know, when we looked at the category strategy stuff, it, it, it did grow organically from that and it grew very quickly. Um, and, and, and then we started to put quite a strong structure, but I think there was quite a bit of organic growth. But then when we started to get into agile delivery, um, that was a very structured type of, you know, kind of how we were growing things. But yeah, early on, that was definitely this organic growth. And, you know, there was the market engagement, looking internationally at the models. You know, that's one of the things I'd say with this, you know, you look at your problem you're trying to address, you're getting engagement from the marketplace. And that's, you know, these ideas were kind of growing organically from that. And then we started to lock it down when we did the market briefing and, you know, locking certain aspects down and letting other aspects sort of grow. Was there any sort of external force or factor that contributed to that, whether it's regulation, um, customer pressure, particularly, you know, for some of the more environmental aspects of the project? Uh, no, probably not specifically. Um, although maybe the the macro environment and why we decided to probably go so quickly is we felt that the timing was right in the marketplace and we also wanted to be you know first mover if you want to use that term because we felt that that was right so we think that kind of macro environment as things were kind of changing although the pandemics changed things that influenced our timing and when we wanted to to go but other other things were happening like i mentioned the construction accord um that helped solidify um, you know, our thinking and where we were going. And I think it probably gave confidence to the board and things like that, that it wasn't just some you know, crazy procurement and infrastructure people coming up with some ideas. Great, uh, Raj is uh, as well congratulating you uh, on your work. He's asking whether you could elaborate a little bit on the types of innovation that your partners um, selected brought to watercare. So was there anything particular? Can do so things that we're using to drive force 2020. Um, quite a few, we've got a sort of long list of things we're chasing after. Um, a lot of stuff is working with the supply chain. So particularly on the, the carbon element. So we're under, we've done an exercise to understand what our program looks like and where the carbon hotspots are so we've identified several um, areas where we can look at straight away so a big part of our program is pipe laying the pipelines so there's a lot of carbon in there in the pipe material and the techniques used to lay so we are looking at trenchless techniques quite openly and materials so any um, yeah so that's quite a good thing also concrete and cement, that's another area that's really high carbon that we're concentrating on. So we've been um, working with some suppliers to create a bit of a roadmap, how we can reduce the carbon over time, what different levers we can pull at different points to reduce that with them. And we've had really good um, buy-in from the suppliers on that. They're really keen. And I think a lot of the supply chain is kind of waiting for the client to make the move and say, this is what we're after. 
and then hopefully that'll open up lots of opportunities for the rest of um, New Zealand to be able to jump on those innovations. So that's our plan. Um, other things we're looking at, there's a lot of process stuff that we're working through. So how can we make these slick processes that take out a lot of waste? How can we use lean? How can we make sure we're doing the collaboration up front? So there's still a lot of effort um, on that kind of thing before we're really moving into the exciting innovations as well. Thanks, Hannah. Um, another positive comment from Renita. She's asking whether the Agile um, methodology was followed from stage one or it started at stage three from the evaluation workshop stage. Uh, stage, well, stage one right from the beginning. So we well, look not right. So I think um, on the slide, which one is she referring to? Effectively, after we've done our engagement, um, yeah, so, so we've done our uh, engagement, we've done our internal workshops to kind of start to do this. And then we actually split up the agile delivery. I was really lucky that Anna, um, I managed to sort of steal her back from doing agile delivery in the digital space. So the timing of that was really good. Um, so I was sitting there scratching my head, how are we going to do this in seven months? The only way we were going to do it was by stealing Anna back. So we got her back and that was the point that we stood it up. And I think we went out to market in three sprints. So it was just a little bit over six weeks, seven weeks to go out to market. Um, which, yeah, that was a bit of a celebration and a relief when we did that. So we, that was kind of the point where we were doing the full scrum agile delivery. Yeah. And we had had a bit of experience in doing um, agile procurement before. So when we did a big digital transformation program, we used agile procurement. So it wasn't new to the to water care and it wasn't new to the procurement team. Obviously, a lot that we hadn't done it with infrastructure. So it was new to them and some of the external advisors but it meant sort of Stuart knew what he was doing and the executive knew what they were doing. So that was good. In terms of the stakeholder engagement and selection, did you use any particular criteria for a big league team like yours? Uh, for some of the pictures, there was quite a large crowds. Do you, did you have any particular approach to that stakeholder engagement and involvement process? Um, so we had kind of a core, we called them the SME group, so the subject matter expert group. So that had representatives from most of the sort of stakeholder groups as part of it. So they were the core people that were involved in the workshops throughout and we had at those sprint reviews. But we really want, I suppose, there were some things that obviously we had to keep very under wraps as part of the procurement process. So those people would have all find the um, conflict, of conflict of interest and that kind of thing. So um, I suppose that was the barrier between keeping them very up to date, but then wider than that, we had to be quite careful what we told people. So we, but because we were so open with the market, then we, then we could be open with the people in the organization as well. And we actually had a change manager resource who helped with that. But I, I guess our strategy is we're gonna engage with everybody it just depended on what type of engagement. So, the, you know, the, the showcases that were mentioned, you know, 170 people across the business turning up, that was an engagement with any stakeholder that wanted to come. Um, then we had structured engagement with our board on a monthly basis. You know, I've had a regular feature there for seven months. And um, we had a steering group, which featured all the executive, which was actually on a weekly basis. Uh, and one of the things with Agile Delivery that we found and, you know, thankfully our executive had been through this and was experienced, but, you know, they need to buy into that engagement and to do things quickly, they have to commit to decision making. And that was either decision making, which I knew I could make on the spot, or the chief infrastructure officer knew, or, you know, we knew at what point but they knew that they had to make a decision and that they couldn't kind of bat it round and delay the process. Um. Got the last two questions, which I think uh, from his mail, which I think we can manage to get. I'd imagine um, he's asking there was some sort of a market sounding or analysis process before you proceeded with the with the procurement process. Yep. Um, so we we at a high level when we'd identify what we wanted to do, we engaged at a very senior level with our. Um, 
incumbent supply chain. Um, we then did a market briefing, which I think 300 people turned up to, and there was a lot of nervousness in the marketplace around that. And um, we were really conscious to effectively communicate what we were doing because uh, the impact that this potentially was going to have and, you know, people had said that it was the hand of God messing in marketplaces and all sorts of kind of crazy things. So that, that clear communication method, but from the, the first open, well, they're all open um, market briefings, but we were really clear on what we wanted. And the second market briefing, we really focused in on the, the people who could deliver this and it wasn't the people down the supply chain. And so I think Anna alluded to that as it meant that through that process, we'd slimmed that right down to, I don't know, maybe it was 15 or so people had come. And then that stage one criteria, which was the pass fail, we actually didn't even need it because the only people who submitted tenders were those ones who could genuinely do it. So that, that real clear communication through the market engagement was, was really key. Um, yeah, and I think it was, it was just two market engagements. We, we had a, there's a terrible YouTube clip of me briefing the marketplace that we put on Tenderlink so people could, could see that. Um, but it was that clear messaging and it was doing two things. It was helping us with our procurement process, but it was also, you know, helping to give clarity to the marketplace that was nervous around, you know, the potential impact of this. That's a good segue in the, in the last questions we have. You've done amazingly well, we managed to answer 15 questions. So, um, was there any transition plan to move from, you know, your incumbent to the new vendors? And did you face any challenges while were you transitioning? Not as many as we thought. Um, what it allowed, and we, we, we have a graph that we, you can kind of see, you know, we had a number of construction contracts that were let. And they were, um, if you like, you know, petering out over time as the new contracts, actually, I think it was one of them, you know, was picking up. So we did, before COVID and drought, we described it as a bit of a nice soft transition into it. Um, but we didn't actually experience, um, you know, a drop off in performance with some of those contractors who had um, missed out. In fact, I, we almost had the opposite behavior. Um, that they actually started performing well because they still wanted to be involved in the business and they were picking up contracts elsewhere and some of our other kind of um, strategic programs that we're putting out to market. So, um, yeah, for, from the marketplace, the tradition stuff, I think transition stuff was better than we had expected. That's been an amazing session. Thank you. Thank you both, Stu and Anna. Uh, such a wealth of, uh, of insights and, and learnings that uh, people can take away. So thank you for sharing, for sharing your story. Um, if you had to leave us with one advice, I'll give it to, you know, maybe 30 seconds each, what would that advice be on organization embarking on a similar journey, thinking about that? Be bold with your strategies. It's more fun. <laughs> that's all be bold it's way more fun challenge yourself and challenge the market challenge your board that's good i was literally gonna say be bold <laughs> <laughs> yeah jump in just, just go for it um yeah you'll learn a lot and don't worry about being perfect first time around yeah, yeah. so thank, thanks very much giovanni for having us today it's been great to present and thanks to sit to the awards as well well, thanks to the questions. Um, yeah. That was uh, really good <laughs> questions. I'd like to get a copy of those and we'll use those to improve our presentation. So, you know, thanks Absolutely. to the audience as well. Yeah. Happy to share and congratulations again. Um, and this is testament of the amazing work that's been recognized, not by SIPS, but a forum of peers. SIPS, you know, puts the, the platform to enable those through the awards, but the work that you've done has been recognized by um, other senior leaders in the profession. So hats off to you guys again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, your story. Um, before we leave, just a quick mention again, if you can fill the survey, it helps us improve and give feedback um, on how we can improve ourselves and our delivery of those webinars. And a couple of more in the pipeline. So on the 21st of October, we have another one of the best in procurement series uh, featuring the public procurement category. That's a very interesting project 
with the University of Procurement Hub. It's, uh, I think it's 17 universities from memory coming together uh, to deliver on one project. And then on the very next day, same time, 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard or 2 p.m. New Zealand, we have the winner of the Procurement Consultancy Project, Kelly OCG, um, sharing their story with their partnering organization uh, being Tate New South Wales. So please join us for those two events. And once again, thank you, Stuart and Anna, for, for your time and support with this. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Until next time, I hope you have a good uh, day and end of the week. See you again.